What's going down, Yens? Casey Kiefer here from the Humanimal Podcast. Got AB sitting here next to me, and we are right dead smack in the middle of kind of the dog days of August. I know it's hotter than the hinges of Hades out there here in Michigan. <laughs> it's like 100 degrees. And uh, it's pretty miserable, but we're inching closer and closer to season, closer and closer to some of that early stuff that takes place in the backcountry, running around chasing the critters in the middle of nowhere where we like to. And uh, I think that's what we're really gearing up for right now. We've had a lot go down here on the humanimal side in just the past couple of weeks. Uh, I was up in Alaska kind of running around the backcountry up there checking out some remote cabin stuff that we were looking at picking up and everything else and got a little bit of flavor of what's to come here in the coming months, but it can't get here soon enough, A.B. That is for sure. I am ready for it to get here right now. Cool. Well, we got, uh, we're got. we going to kick this off today. We want to have just an awesome conversation and more or less a straight-up bullshit shit session with, uh, with a guy that I have watched from afar. I've watched the company uh, that they have built and grown and been very envious of what they've been able to do because they, you know, first and foremost, they speak to to quality products and quality people, right? And uh, I think we're super excited to have on the podcast today, we've got Aaron Snyder, uh, president of Kafaru International, which is super exciting. And I think we got Aaron on the line. So Aaron, you, can you hear us, man? Yep, I can hear you. I appreciate you guys uh, having me on. Good deal, man. So what's going on out there? Are you guys hotter than hell like we are here or what? Yeah, I mean, I, man, I, I, I live at 10,000 feet. It's never very hot in my house. <laughs> I think uh, 80 is about as hot as it gets. Down yeah. in Denver, it's quite a bit quite a bit hotter, obviously. But, yeah, yeah, up here is nice. Uh, I can't complain. I'm envious, man. I wish. Yes. I, I wish I was at 10,000 feet all year round. It's unfortunate because I'm stuck over here in the state of Michigan, right, where it's a beautiful state. we got a whole lot going on, but nothing like you've got going on out west. That's why. Usually in the middle of August every year, I blow out of Michigan, and I don't come back until December, <laughs> Get January. the hell out of here. We, yeah. need, we need bigger country. <laughs> yeah, I don't come back until, like, December, January. So, um, you know, like I said, we're super excited to have you on. Um, you know, I paid attention to uh, you personally and what you've got going on with Kafaru for a long time, going back years now. Uh, and I have been a firm believer in the, in the company, firm believer in the products. I mean, hell, I think I even have some old Mountain Smith stuff still hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> you know, from back in the day. So, you know, first and foremost, just wanted to throw kudos out there to what you guys have been able to build, you know, over there, Kafaru. You guys just do incredible stuff. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's been uh, been an adventure uh, for me. I did not uh, I did not have any idea that I would uh, end up where I'm at. Um, I just I just wanted to spend a ton of time in the woods and, and hunt until my legs fell off. And then all this other stuff is kind of an ancillary benefit of that so it's been pretty wild yeah the the whole oh look what happened kind of thing right <laughs> yeah 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 exactly i i'm probably not the best kind of introverted probably not the best person in the world to be in the position that i'm in but i'm i'm winging it i'm uh figuring it out day by day <laughs> you're Shooting like from the hip you're like me man fake it till you make it wing it and <laughs> it's, it's so funny because I, I talk to people about that quite often like for For a guy that, for good or bad, and one reason or another, I've spent, you know, the last 10 to 15 years of my life with these adventures that we go on, playing out on television, but I'm like the most private guy. I don't like people to know what it is I'm doing. Like He hates people. I do. No, he does. I I do, man, but, you know, people see this stuff play out on TV, which is a little bit interesting, but like you, I've learned to deal with it, I guess. We put it out there, and hopefully people enjoy it. So, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, for me, I was only going to do – I was only going to do two things with my life. I was only either going to play hockey or hunt for a living because that's the only two things I was ever any good at. So I guess I'm doing one of them. <laughs> Obviously, I don't have any Stanley Cup rings. So so I think we're dialed there. But, uh, you know, Aaron, <laughs> I want to talk to you in particular about because this is something that, you know, guys that do it the way you do and guys that get out there and just, you know, spend as much time as humanly possible roaming around the mountains just doing their thing. And I try to do that. Uh, and have tried to do that since I was 15 years old. I got I got into the industry as a guide, and I was a guide from the time I was 15 until I was in my 20s. I would hopscotch the globe everywhere from you know northern Canada to uh, the the lower 48, then over to New Zealand. I just kind of did the whole circle, just trying to spend as much time out there as possible. But I, I always try to get out of people. You know, there was a moment in time for all of us where we try to look back and we say that was the very moment that I know 
I was born for the backcountry, right? I was born to get out there and do this, and this is my calling, and this is what I wanted to do. Do you have that, like, pinpoint? Because mine is pin, literally pinpoint. I can tell you exactly where I was, what I was sitting, what the sights and sounds were, all of that stuff, those intimate details. Do you have a moment like that in your past, Aaron, where you're like, yep, I knew right then and there this is what I was going to do? Yeah, pretty pretty close. Um, you know, I always liked the outdoors, and as a kid running around shooting – shit with my bb gun i shouldn't have been and but the, as far as the back country and i was on a trail crew team um basically they had a youth conservation program uh for you know from a very small community 200 people mm-hmm. uh for the forest service and mostly it was just cleaning shitters and you know cleaning state parks but there were me and, and adam crowfoot uh, one of my buddies i played football with the trail crew team picked us up even though we were young obviously kids to hike the wilderness areas uh i hike all the trails in the wilderness near my house and clean them you know whether it be old growth that had fallen in the way you'd have to cut it out of the way with a cross cut saw or an axe and the first backpack trip we did normally it was in and out like 10 15 miles a day yeah but we we backpacked in like way into a lake i'd never normally backpack into and that that was the moment i'm like okay I like it back here. Like this is away from everyone. Yeah. Uh, I'm relying on myself to survive and my knowledge. And as a kid, you know, it was like, you know, the glass is really easy to fill the cup when you're a kid. Right. So I'm like the, the smell of white gas from the, uh, you know, the MSR whisper lights with what we had back <laughs> in the day yeah. and uh, crappy, crappy backpacks and a foam pad and what would probably kill me nowadays. Cause uh, I'm getting old, but that was the, one of those specific trips was the moment I was like, okay, this is for me. I, I need to be in the wilderness all the time, whether it be hunting or backpacking or fishing. It was just my thing. I, I knew I, I needed to spend as much time in the woods as I could. So really the best thing that, uh, you know, that ever happened to you was, you know, some state employee looking at you going, there's, there's fresh meat, a fresh <laughs> set of legs that can hike his ass all the way there's back There's a Sherpa here. for me. Yeah, let's let's yeah, send his yeah. ass back as, in there with as, some axes. <laughs> as, as some of the people are listening in, I was making three twenty five an hour cutting down old growth trees with a cross cut saw oh, for dude. for literally, you know, because you're, you know, June, July, August, you know, yeah. you get three months off. Uh, making three twenty five an hour and, uh, uh, you know, overhand chop type, you know, people watch TV, but, you know, with an yeah, axe yeah. and lopping branches, uh, you know, Pulaski's making cutting trail digging, you know, basically like drainages yep. for three twenty five an hour and was happy to do it because we were poor and I bought my school clothes with that money. Yeah. So I don't have a lot of sympathy for some of the shit that I hear from some of the kids nowadays. I, I I'm was, like, I was really? Gonna, you sound just, really. <laughs> there's kids that do that all over today, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. They're around every corner, right? They might be uh, playing it on an, uh, on an iPad or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Playing, playing uh, you, you Oregon think, Trail. You know, you, you think about it, it's how you're, you're raised. You know, I wasn't, yeah. I had a pretty rough childhood, but when you're raised where the outdoors is, okay man, I can't wait. We're going to hike in and get to see all this country because there's a lightning strike and then go dig fire line around it in the middle of nowhere and eat crappy food. And hopefully we can find water. And you're excited about that. Yeah. That's the kind of kid that I want to see. Not the kid that can't wait to get off work to go play Nintendo. Yep. yep. I'm, I'm with you, man. Or whatever mm-hmm. it's called nowadays. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's probably not called Nintendo anymore, but <laughs> what, what they had back then. I'm old. That's, that's Nintendo and Atari. I, I was going for Atari. You said Nintendo. So I'm like, yeah, it is what it is, right? Yeah. No, you're right, man. There's there's not enough of that today, and that you know that subject alone is youth and kids and and what the hell's going on and how kids are being raised nowadays. I'm I'm not out there to tell anybody how to raise their kids, but there's a whole lot of people doing it wrong. So it's uh, it's crazy to see. But you're right. I mean, when when you're excited to suffer and you embrace the suck and you're ready to rock and roll, like to me, I don't know. That that's just that, that's part of the whole experience. I look forward to the shit as much as I look forward to the good stuff. Anytime we head out there. Um, and usually if the good stuff is good enough, it turns into shit anyway, cause you got to pack it out, yeah. which never <laughs> yeah. is easy. So yep, one yep. way or another, you're going to hit something negative. Yep. Or bad. That's exactly right. You know, so, so, you know, your moment, my moment, I happen to be, I happen to be laying in the middle of a catamaran out in the middle of the Bering Sea, 
hitched up to the side of a crab boat that was they were using the catamaran to run my brother and i to shore way out in the aleutian islands we were chasing caribou around and uh in the middle of a storm one night i thought the catamaran was sinking we were taking on water i mean we were laying there pitch black and we could just hear the club 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 like we're like oh this isn't good and right then and there you know both of us kind of looked at each other and decided like yeah we could we could spend our time way more uh, wisely out here than anywhere else in the world so you know i just always love diving into that moment of truth when when people have that realization of like this shit this is what i want to do yep. you know so and everybody's got a little different perspective on it now, when you're out there you know how many days of field you think you spend a year Aaron? Mm, on the uh, you know with guiding and hunting and everything else nights i would say pretty easily 100 to 125 yeah well over 200 um, you know, with days with, you know, cause a lot of times like in the Davis mountains, we're not, you know, staying out there, but right. you know, a couple of hundred or more, um, you know, we, we do like right now we've got three back to back to back 14 day backpack hunts. Yep. Um, and that's just getting things warmed up. So, right. you know, quite a bit of time and I don't, uh, you know, I don't get tired of it. And every now and then I need to you know, probably eat a cheeseburger and, you know, drink a little more water or something. But I mean, <laughs> overall, I, 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 I enjoy every every minute of it even like you guys talked about the mental uh you know your the human mind is a very powerful thing and it can make you or break you and it's amazing yeah. to me some of the different stories i hear where guys came off the mountain or what it what happened and it's like you know that's part of the fun i mean you know oh it rained for three days yeah it happens i mean yeah. you, <laughs> you know Adapt. suck it up rubs yeah, rub some dirt in your crotch. I mean, what are you going to do, right? Just figure it out. <laughs> yep, figure it out. Uh, that's uh, the mental aspect is I think I get a, I get that, you know, question all the time of, hey, man, I'm going I'm going to Alaska. I'm going to the backcountry. I'm going to go do this and do that. Like, what do I need to do to get ready? And it's like, wow, that's a really – That's a broad question. That's a pretty broad question, <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, you, you know, you can be the strongest man in the world, but if your mind ain't right, exactly, you're toast. You know, you, you can get screwed real quick. Yeah. And, I, you know, because of conversations like this, I'm curious why a lot of people think I'm a dick because I'm so blunt. But I mean, there's a lot of things that people, if you really took a step back and were kind of owned your own crap and were honest with yourself, including me and you two. I, I mean, yeah. I could, like a, a guy, example, recently came to my house, had plantar fasciitis. I've tried everything. I've stretched. I've foam rolled, dry needling. And I'm thinking, did you lose 50 pounds? Yeah. Because that take it away. Yeah. Like, they just really try everything. And the mountains are the same way. Like, you know, well, I, I made it as long as I could have, and I, I had to come out. Eh. Yeah. Unless somebody was dying, you didn't have to come <laughs> yeah. out, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and a lot of it's what the, the uh, you know, the glass is half full. I mean, you can make the best of some pretty crappy situations, whether you're solo or with a buddy. It's all a matter of perspective and what you're wanting out of it, you know. If you're wanting – joyful perfect days every day you're probably not going to last too long out there you know with all those trips that you have that you've done in the past and you know you're you're a field hundreds of days how many trips can you count on where you were like i gotta get the fuck out of here like this is this is i'm in a bad situation right now you know what bad situation never uh really i came out i came out early in 2019 i missed uh and I know what it scores because they killed it in the wintering <laughs> land uh, with the rifle. Uh, it was 203, uh, 32 and a half wide mule deer mm -hmm. in the cliffs. Um, about killed myself trying to kill it. And I had a day, you know, I'd missed it midday, like at noon. And I had an extra day before I went to a, I still had a day left of hunting. And I climbed to the top. I called my wife and I said, I'm, I'm coming home. And she later was like, it's a day early. And she, cause that's not normally what you hear from me. And yeah, I'm like, no, yeah, yeah. no, I'm, <laughs> I'm done. Uh, I was like, I don't think he's coming back for a few days and get an extra day break. But you know, one, actually one time when I tried to, to follow the, uh, you know, I actually wrote an article about it, chase the ultra lightweight rabbit where I had a, you know, a, a, a liquid, like a, not a white gas, but, a um, uh, whatever you want to call that, the, uh, the little beer can stoves yep. um, and, a, and, a, and a tarp and, uh, you know, the, the quilt and basically what's stupid is what I was. I went as light as I could thinking that and a storm came in. I probably did three, 400 push ups every night to try to, and, you know, after four nights, 
I couldn't take it. My body was abused and I came off the mountain early yeah. and that was just mentally broke down. I could have, I could have stayed, I guess if I needed to or had to or whatever, but yeah. hardly ever do I ever have to, man, we bring a good enough gear and have enough of a skill set. It would take a lot for us to have to come yep. off the mountain early. I mean, a lot. Yeah. Um, the men, the mental side. I, I always talk yeah. to people about like when you're out there. You're at least in my opinion, your mind is going to break down long before your body does, provided you go in in the right way, yep. right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I I met a guy one time in a hangar in Fairbanks, and uh, this guy was sitting there, and I swear to you, in all my days of of doing this, I have never seen somebody that looked as ass whooped as this guy did. I really? mean, this dude was just cooked. <laughs> And he had a beautiful moose. He had like a 65 inch moose sitting on the ground in front of him. But he, like, he was soulless. Like, you could look into his eyes, and the dude just wasn't. He there. went to the end of his existence. Yeah. Basically. So, so I, you know, I start chatting with this guy, and I'm like, you know, what's up, man? How was your trip? How'd it go? Great moose. Looks awesome. And he's like, yeah. And I, that's all I get out of him. And I'm like, you know, you seem a little down. What's going on? He's like, well, I decided. He's out there by himself, and he's like, I killed my moose, and I was four. I think he was four miles off the river. Oh, jeez. By himself. Ooh. And, yeah, it was the next, like, week of his life was pure hell. Uh, Grizzlies moved in. Weather moved in. He's trying to pack the moose from, you know, where he killed it back to the river. And, he, I mean, listen, he did it, but he was just mental mush. Like, wow. he, the guy was just completely cooked. So, you know, the the mind is, is, a, is a crazy thing because it can tap out, you know, in a hurry. <clears throat> what uh, – what do you think when you're out there, especially for an extended period of time? What's the longest you think you've done out there, Aaron? Like consecutive days in, I, in the bush? Uh, consecutive for six, 16 solo six, six consecutive. Yeah. 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 So what, yeah. Do you, what, and, what are you chasing when you're out there? Like, and I'm not talking animal-wise because for me, you know, yeah, I'm, I might be on a moose hunter or, or mm-hmm. a bear hunt or a caribou hunt or whatever that might be, but I'm chasing something totally different. You know, what are you, what are you after? What makes you tick? So – I mean, the, hard, the easiest way to explain it is when when we're all, I don't know, make it 80, and you look back, you really want to look back and think, yeah, I remember that one hunt, I made it four days Yeah. when I was supposed to go eight. Right. Well, I'm always just happy to be there the whole time, so adventure, you know, getting away from everyone, being alone, testing my skill set, you know, testing my, you know, everything, right? I mean, for me, it's like normal like if i didn't do that i I wouldn't i don't you ever watch the golden compass when they take the bear's armor yeah you take backcountry hunting and hunting from me like you've taken my soul and so for me when people talk about leaving early i'm like how could you leave early right you waited 365 days to do it to bitch (laughs) out (laughs) like you drove your wife crazy spent tons of money to hike out early what you know and i'm gonna piss a lot of people off because they're probably listening now they're gonna be listening thinking hey i did that but truly that is a mental mindset to, yep. to stay. And for me, I don't, I don't really have to, there is no like, you know, uh, any kind of Buddhism going on the side of the mountain to talk me to stay on. You usually got to talk me to come off. Right. And so I just love all of it. And, you know, you rewind 150 years, I would have been pretty happy, you know, as, as a mountain man within reason, I don't want to get scalped, but you know, I like a simpler <laughs> lifestyle. So yeah, I mean, I, that's, it's all, that's what I, that's what I like to do. So adventure, I mean, just do epic shit is, you know, and not for the gram. I just want to be out there and do cool stuff. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Cause you only have so long to do it too. Like you said, I mean, once you're 80, you're, you're pretty much probably tapped out. You know, eighty, dude. I hope to make it to thirty-nine. Yeah, well, let's, yeah. let's be honest. About let's two, do forty first. About two weeks ago, I didn't think I'd be here at thirty-nine. So, uh, I was uh, I was fortunate enough. We haven't actually even talked about this story nope. yet, but I was fortunate enough a couple of weeks ago to survive my very first plane crash uh, in Alaska. I was up there tooling around in the backcountry and came out of the sky like a like a lawn like dart. a missile <laughs> yeah, came out of the sky like a lawn dart in a 206 and plowed right into the ground at about 100 freaking 10 knots uh in the middle of the bush took me like three i think three days three and a half days to find a pilot that would even fly out there to come get me through the sat phone and everything else so it was uh well, let's was, throw it out you weren't flying either you were with a pilot yeah and I it was 100 percent his fault yeah you I was, know i wasn't flying yeah no, i wish i would have been because i'd have done a better <laughs> job than he did but no it was it was quite a shit show but well if, even that you know like 
uh, people panic in that situ- you know, situation. I've only been in that, you know, situation a couple of times, but yeah. you know, you, you deal with what the hand that, you know, yeah. God gave you or whatever you want to look at it and you can cry like a bitch or you can make something of it and come out. And yeah. A lot of people, you know, I, I, and I, I'm not trying to make you or me or, or, or my partner, Frank or anyone sound like a badass. It's not a physical thing. It's yeah. mental. It's a mindset. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you're a big fat fucker, a little bit different. But I mean, if you're mentally strong and you're large, you're going to be way better than a dude super fit that's not mentally strong. I mean, 100%. You, yeah, you can make it. You just got to assess what you've got, kind of, you know, do a quick survey of surroundings and figure it out. Yep. Um, very rarely is it, you know, life or death. It's only life or death in your own mind. Yep. That's what a lot of people do. It becomes life or death in their mind. That's a great way of putting it. They freak out, they panic, and then, you know, ultimately they're their own worst enemy in the long run. So, um, yeah, we've all had those trips, you know, at least where at some point it seems like shit hits the fan. So, you know, you get that point where you don't think you're going to make it. It's that, you know, it's that fine line in your mind of being like, you know what, I got this shit. We're going to do it. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep rolling. Um, You know, I've had plenty of those days out there and, you know, you just go in with the right mindset and you'll be all right. And I think, you know, ultimately when it comes down to it, all that experience and all, all those moments and all that stuff that you push through for me, you know, there, when we talk about people, you know, how do I get ready to go out there? There really is no substitute for just hard days earned and spent in the field. You know, I mean, you, you can think you you're in control all you want, but until you get out there and realize that you're not in control, you just got to suffer through that shit to know what it's like, to learn what it's like, and to be able to push on through the next one. Because, you know, to your point earlier, Aaron, at some point when you're out there, something's going to go to shit, right? Whether it's the big, long-ass pack out, which means you're successful, or you run into issues, who knows what, right? I mean, our guys in Colorado last year, what, Lee VDB went down and snapped an ankle, and they were, yep. I don't know how many miles deep, right? Well, within like six hours overnight when they were sleeping, they had like, six foot of snow come in yeah, the big as they were sleeping and trees started falling everywhere and they're like we got to get the hell out of here kind of thing and as they were making their descent you know he fell off you know one of the cliffs and broke his leg and you know had to hit the, the sos button and yeah. get try to get horses up there to get him because they couldn't fly in yeah. it was it was a debacle but you know what i firmly believe in in what what lee's situation that dude never gave up because nope. he hit the sos and they did everything they could do but at the same time he freaking wrapped his belt up, put his belt in his mouth, and kept trudging. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And kept going and kept going and kept going. And ultimately, yep. you know, they, they met search and rescue like 100 yards from the trail. <laughs> so, <laughs> right at the trail. Yeah, after, well, mi- after miles and miles. So. Yep. You know, look, looking at that, like uh, there, there's what he did, which is sucking it up and doing your best. Yeah. And then there's – you don't have a choice. You got to do something, right? You, you don't have a choice. Die, yep. yep. Right? But yep. – it's what you do when you make those choices. So let's say water. Water is always a crisis in the hike. Not always, but a lot of times it's a crisis. So, mm-hmm. you know, you'll hear guys, well, I ran out of water. I had to come out. And I'm like, so animals have no place to drink. Right. Or did you just weren't man enough or, or whatever, physically able enough to drop 800 feet every couple of days or 1,000 feet in elevation and get water? To get water. There's water. And, that again, it's like, okay, if you were stranded, you would walk down and get that water, but since you can hit the easy button, you came out. And if that's your choice, that's your choice. But having that mental and physical ability to say, all right, I'm just going to have to suck it up and climb down in this hole and get water, um, you know, or bite my belt and limp my ass out. Right. I mean, he could have just laid there until somebody came and got him and maybe froze to death, but he knew he didn't want to depend on other people for his own survival, so he folded up the belt, bit the shit out of it, and started yep. limping out. Yeah, that's exactly you got to hand happened. it to him. Yep. Yeah. And kept going. <clears throat> so, you know, ultimately for me, I think all that all that experience, they're, they're the only way to do it is to get out there and do it. Just right? do it. Yeah. It's the only, only way to make it happen. So I can't help but think all the experience and everything that you go through when you're out there and, and you know, those that you surround yourself with, is that what you guys put into Kafaru from a design aspect and from a – you know, from a needs and necessities aspect when it comes to the equipment you guys are making? Yeah, uh, yeah, 100%. I mean, that's kind of one of the, you know, glorious things of having, uh, you know, F- Frank, my uh, my my partner, he doesn't, uh, he's he's more introverted than I am, and he wouldn't say shit if his mouth was full of it. One of the toughest <laughs> guys you'd ever meet is we go out there, and when we put ourselves 
in certain situations, you know, how light can we make the pack before it's not durable enough? Yeah. Um, you know, should we add something here or there to make the pack out easier? Uh, you know, do we add in like our puffy jacket? You're not going to win any, um, you know, beauty contests with our puffy jacket, but you're not going to die. Yeah. Um, and we made it for that reason, because getting, you know, trying to sit behind glass on a sheep or a mule deer hunt when there's snake, you know, snow and rain, sleet, snow, whatever, that it can get soaking wet, still keep you warm. You can low crawl in it. It's not going to shred. Uh, you know, those are out of necessity because nobody else was building it. Yep. Um you know, and there's lots of good products on the market, but when we designed something like the, the Striker, which is one of our, our packs, we needed to design a pack that could literally, I mean, I got a bunch of shit for it, but I strapped a 328-pound Audad on it just to see if I could break it. Yeah. Well, people try to do that. Guys gave me a, I mean, it's funny, you know, the internet. You should put weights on it. That's a better way. Well, we don't hunt 45 pound plates <laughs> and guys are going to yeah. strap guys will strap an entire animal to this. So we have to test it to see if there's failures to it. And, and if there is, we need to let people know, or tr if, if we can't make it durable enough to handle a 300 pound awkward load that, Hey, yep, guys, you pushed it to the max. And you know, we, you know, that, that's something we know, or we can prepare for, or we can let know people know what they should do, how to strap it on, do a video, whatever. Um, and, and you don't get that from a lot of companies. I think a lot of companies, their users are their R and D, right. and they fix it along as as they go. Which, in my mind, that is the worst possible scenario <laughs> because, yeah. you know, you guys, when you look at the amount of time you spend out there and the shit that you put gear and equipment through, and this is, you know, some of the stuff that that you know over the years we've we've kind of tried to at least pride ourselves on a little bit on the R and D side is, you know, we probably put through. Our gear in one season is probably average of about four or five seasons or more for what the normal standard kind of guy would put it through. Yep. You know, so having that real world design is is to me like there's no replacement for it. That's why I've been a fan of what it is that you guys do, and I've been using you know your your shit for for a long time because there's something to be said, especially out there in the middle of nowhere, and even in the whitetail woods. For me, like I'm a big fan of utilitarian shit right stuff that has a purpose and this is the purpose exactly. and, and it's not frills it's not a lot of bells and whistles you're not gonna you know to your point win any beauty contest with any of it but son of a bitch it does exactly what it needs to do and it's not going to fail you mm -hmm. you know you can depend on it absolutely because there's nothing more important to me than confidence in my equipment you know when i'm out there whether that's you know my my bow setup or all the way down to the pack i have strapped on my back or the laces that are in my boots you know what i mean it's all it's all important shit and that that real world experience is only half the equation though because then it comes down to at some point, you know, that the top notch kind of craftsmanship side of things, right? Because you can di design one thing, but if you're, if you're not, if you're not getting that craftsmanship, you know, up to, you know, the quality that it needs to be, then really you've just designed something that's beautiful. that sucks, yeah, yep. you know? So, yeah. And I mean, I, I'm lucky enough. I get to, and I mean, honestly, the better the company does, the more I'm going to hunt, but you know, I guide for three to four months and I hunt for three to four months. Mm -hmm. So we're packing, you know, 50 to 70 animals out at them. When I say a real pack out, meaning at some distance, um, you know, and sometimes the you're with a client and he can't carry anything. So all of a sudden you're like, oh, I thought I was going to have 100 pounds on my back and now I yeah. have 170. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're able to see the longevity of the packs too. Like, hey, you know, my shoulder straps are getting flat. And, oh, how long have you had it? Oh, three years I've packed out X amount. I'm like, oh, yeah, we need to swap them out. Uh, you know, they only, you know, only so you know, they only last for so long. Right. Well, then we can look at upgrading foam, which we have, you know, in recent years that will last longer. It's hydrophobic, so it doesn't stink as bad. It's it's just basically setting each customer up for the highest potential or highest possibilities they can for comfortable success. Because if you shoot the animal and, you know, the, that's part of the success, you got an animal – but if you can't walk for three weeks after the hike out, yep. hey, you got it. There's yep. some success there, but it could have been a lot better. Yep. Uh, you know, if you if you could actually function as a normal human and walk right when you were done. Yeah, or if you tap on the pack out and mm -hmm. your, your meat spoils and shed. In, you know, I mean that that's only half the battle. You know, I think yep. my first exposure 
you know, I grew up Western Pennsylvania, um, you know, watching the, the real tree monster buck videos, right. And, and kind of that whole, like, at least what I call the early days of hunting and how products are being promoted and developed and everything else. And, you know, I was kind of just like everybody else, wherever I could buy the camo, I buy the camo and throw it on and we'll see what happens. And, you know, as I got into guiding and I got more experienced, I got to, I got to know a guy pretty well. Uh, his name's Davey Hughes out of New Zealand. And Davey started a company called Swazi and, I got to shooting the shit with him one day when we first met, and I said, you know, talk to me about Swazi. Like, what's the deal behind Swazi and yada, yada? And he's like, well, you know, I was trekking the Nile River, and I was on foot, and I was trying to do the entire Nile on foot, and I got hung up in a monsoon kind of rainstorm-type deal at a certain point, and I literally had to lay on the river's edge because the river got swollen so bad and I had to kind of get in this little cave type thing and I was in this cave and I ended up spending like four days in there because the water was was so high and so bad and all the clothes that I had on my back were were drenched and falling apart and ripped to shit and soaking wet and I wanted to walk the Nile a second time so when I did I said well I guess if I'm going to do it a second time I should probably get better clothing and if I'm going to get better clothing there's only one way to do that and that's to make it. So he started making his own clothing, you know, and so that was like my first exposure to, uh, you know, somebody that was putting the level of, of knowledge and that level of real world experience into design, you know, similar to the way that you guys do over there, you know, at, at Kafaru. So yeah, Davey and I are buddies. He's funny. He's a trip. Oh, he's a riot, <laughs> isn't he, dude? He's, he's literally like, he's one of the funniest guys I've ever met. <laughs> um yeah he's a he's a bush hippie is what we call him. <laughs> yeah that's right he's a complete and total bush hippie yep that is exactly oh, the the best way to put it he's a freaking rock star though um you know and for that just talking about the kind of guy that he is you know a lot of times companies for me comes down to the people behind the products right and the people behind the products i think you know, when you start looking at almost any iconic brand or any iconic company that makes products that are worth a shit, you find that the people are the backbones of those of those companies and those products. And if you can believe in the people, then you can believe in the products, no problem, yeah. right? So, and that's what I like too is in in Kafara. When I see you, you know, I follow you on social media and everything like that. And when I see you out there grinding it out and you know trying out all your stuff and your packs and your you know, everything you guys have to offer, I'm like, that's something I want to be involved in. Like, I want to find what fits me the best, you know, for what I do for hunting. I do majority whitetail hunting, you know, so this year I bought a Hellcat. Like, you know, you guys' lumbar pack that I freaking love that thing. That thing is going to be perfect for me, like a day pack. Like, I like seeing you and how invested you are in it with all your, you know, employees. And that's something I want to buy into as a consumer. And uh, that's what I take mostly from it and your guys's quality is second to none you know yeah i i think that uh you know like with davy you know we've had davy on the podcast and he's you know i've you know promoted swazi forever clay lancasters who showed it to me initially yeah um when you uh when the, i mean <laughs> when the rubber meets the road what you've got is all you've got right like when you're back there so what <laughs> i mean davy's right he and i he was laughing because i'm relatively young compared to Davey. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but he, you know, he enjoys singing young guys getting after it was what, one of the things we were talking about is, you know, when people are like, what are the, the top things, you know, in your pack? And I always respond, unless I'm being a smart ass, I say Copenhagen is, uh, you know, common <laughs> sense, men, men, you know, yeah. mental toughness, uh, you know, yeah. skill, field craft. That's more important. And then after that, cause I have that, then I put what I need in my pack to, to go along with what skill set I have, meaning I know what I need. I don't have gear lists anymore. I don't, um, nothing wrong with those, you know, especially to help you remember what put in the pack. But, yeah. you know, what I've got in my pack has been proven, tried, true. And no matter what's, you know, coming at us, we're, we're going to be okay. And that's, that's kind of the level you want to get at. Uh, Davey's obviously at that level, you know, no matter what. And, and, and there's many others. Yeah. Can you head into the wilderness? Can you run downstairs right now, load some crap in your pack? And, you know, they're coming to my house to take my guns, and I'm going to run and hide. Yeah, I can last a long time because of the work I've put into all of this, as well as you guys and many others. If you don't get out there, you're just playing on the Internet. You know, you you, you got to learn um, – you, you can't buy uh, you can't buy work ethic and, and knowledge and wisdom. you got to get out there and do it. 
Yep. So I had a tax bill one time going into New Zealand of eight hundred and twenty five dollars <laughs> because of the amount of Copenhagen I took in. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you uh, chew it for breakfast, yeah, uh, basically, yeah, I run on Copenhagen and cuss words over here, so you know, we got a lot in common there. Um, yeah, same same thing. What do you? Uh, what do you, you think is going on with hunting right now? Like, status of the industry, status of what's happening out there. I mean, I'm not a big social media guy. I don't do social media at all. But, you know, with all the stuff that you see, you know, or maybe you don't see going on out there, I mean, what do you – I just love picking people's brains on what they think is happening. Um, I, th- I think it's growing, specifically the Western hunting. What kind of makes me nervous is you've got several different companies that are starting to lean pretty far left – their financial backers are, oh, yeah. um, you know, are fun. You know, they're being funded by anti Second Amendment, anti predator yeah. hunting, anti hunting. You know, uh, you know, monetary or what would you call it? Um, they're green they're, decoys, they're, man. <laughs> ba- yeah, ba- basically, you know, you've got the BHA who, at face value, sounds good, but in reality, I don't think it is good. Yep. You know, you just had Tucker Carlson on uh, the Meat Eater podcast. That should tell you right there the following the meat eater has. Yeah. That guy's a very patriotic, very pro Second Amendment American, and gets blasted from the meat eater following. Yeah, blasted, no, literally that's not blasted. Good. It's not good. I know. What, what I mean, what's that tell you, right? I mean, yep. and again, I I get some of the, you know, I I can use my own brain. Are all grip and grins good? Now, nah, some are for buddies, right? You know, there's some distasteful photos, but overall, should we be embarrassed that we? took an animal i don't i don't think we should i think that we should present it the the adventure the challenge everything and then the the goal at the end is an animal on the ground and then you go eat it yeah it's a circle of life right and so being able to communicate um that hey if you're eating cheeseburgers from mcdonald's that was an animal too we're just doing it on our own yeah um we're, we're earning it I think that's a good thing, but in the middle of all this, you get these kind of, yeah, green decoys or people that, um, you know, um, don't have the backbone or spine to turn down money um, to stand for maybe what they believe in or what is right. Yep. And when I say that, meaning we recently had a company approach Kafaru that offered us a ridiculous amount of money for the company, and we didn't make it five minutes into the conversation. I'm like, no. No way. And no, you can keep all your employees, whatever. And I was like, I don't give a shit. No way am I selling to you ever. Like, don't even ever call me back because their views are or or they don't parallel ours. They're they're, They are anti predator hunting when you uncover the layers or they are anti Second Amendment when you uncover the layers, no matter how hidden it is. Yep. And there's a lot of people not standing up for that. They're going for the money, and that scares the shit out of me. Um, I'm with you. Scares the shit out of me, too. When I look at some of this stuff, and and in some instances, you know, it, it, it's not it's not, it's not not all that well hidden. You mm-hmm. start looking at who the no. financial backers are, some of these, you know, groups and organizations, and where the – I mean, if all else fails, it's the same as anything else in the world, right? Follow the money. <laughs> and when you start following the money, you look at it, and it's shocking. It's like, holy shit, you know. I just hope well, – I, I hope people I start don't mind to realize it. You guys can edit it out. I mean, I don't mind the the meat eater um, is, is one that is is financially backed by the Chernin Group, yeah, who Peter they Chernin. only own two two out of the five seats, as I understand on the board. But here's the bottom line, and you can twist this shit however you want. When you buy something, whether it be first light camo or something the meat eater sells or whatever, if your main financial backer you know, that that's backing you needs, he's not doing it for free. Yep. He's going to get money. He invested in that. Yeah. When you spend that money, that is some of that money is going back to a person that donates a significant amount of money to anti second amendment and anti predator hunting campaign. Yep. So you are financing, you, you know, you might as well buy Nike. Yep. Like you're funding you know, your own I've, demise. Yes. That's, that's oh, yeah. what it comes and, down to. And people have come back and said, well, what kind of phone do you use? I'm like, well, I've had a droid. I've got an iPhone. And I'm like, well, there, there is no other option. If there was, believe me, I would use it. You have multiple options for clothing. You have yeah. multiple options for footwear. For I mean, you name it. And it's like, I'm not saying they're bad guys. And I'm not saying what they're doing at face value is bad for hunting. But the big picture, I think it's very bad because not only are we financing our enemy, we're also okay with it, yep. right? 
it's not just that where that money's going. It's that people are like, ah, they're cool guys. It's okay. Well, Charles Manson was pretty fucking cool to a lot of people too, but look how that turned out. Yep. <laughs> uh, dude, that's an eloquent way to put it. If I've ever heard it. I mean, I, I think everybody gets so caught up in that, like, man, I want to be kind of part of the click and they're super cool dudes. Yep. And you know, I'm just yeah. like, Whoa, uh, you fucking blinders are, are bad on some of this stuff. So, I mean, when does this stuff starting get, I mean, I know it's out there. It's public knowledge. You can see it, but when does it really get blown out and, and exposed though? Or do you people know? just not care enough? Exactly. I think that's kind of what just we're like, talking about. People just don't care. It's like, you know, I like the look of looks of first light and I'm just going to, you know, it's the cool thing to do. You know, is that what it is? I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like the, they were smart. I mean, the meat eater was, um, you know, he's done a lot for honey. You can't take that. You know, he's, he's been great. And that's the thing that's that's crazy is, okay, to, to what end, like, you know, there's a, pot, a lot of people that were good and, and changed, right? And so I'm not saying what he's done is bad. That's where I get into arguments with people. I'm not right. saying that it's what is he doing now? What is the company doing now? And what are the long-term ramifications of that to, to, to what I love? And somebody's got to say something and I'll be the, I don't mind at all. I'll be the dick in the group. I'll say something because it's like, look, if somebody doesn't say something, at least pay, make people aware of this, what's going to happen in 10 years when we lose more predator hunting, we can't, you know, Miley Cyrus was, I think the main problem with bear hunting and with BC grizz hunting. Yeah. Well, okay. Miley Cyrus, how, how many days has she spent in the wilderness? Probably not too many, but she had the money to to fund some some very major anti you know grizzly hunting uh propaganda type you know whatever you want to call it um they, they had a lot of uh they had a lot of marketing in that yeah well if you're buying clothing that's going to the churning group uh the money's going to the churning group that's going to be funding things that we love to do and then people will say things like well i don't grizzly hunt right. well yeah i'm not a brain surgeon and don't plan on getting one but i tell you what at some point in time it's going to be need important one. to me or some, yeah, <laughs> yeah. somebody might, or once you give a little ground, all right, they took bear hunting. Now are they going to go for multiple other types of predator hunting? And then, well, now they've got a little bit of courage. It'll right. be a trickle gonna, effect, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah. Now they're going to dive into ungulates, you know, sheep, mule deer. Well, they're, they're already trying. And so I'm not saying the far right side of the world is perfect. We got a lot of people shooting holes in the boat. Yep. But when you have somebody in the boat rowing literally the same direction you are, but secretly is drilling holes in the bottom of the boat when you don't know, yeah. that's some underhanded shit, and yep. that really bothers me. Yep. That's one of the first things when I saw that whole deal go down, I was kind of like, ooh. Mm -hmm. And I expected it to make waves, and I think a lot of people just kind of were like, yeah, whatever. And I'm yep. like, yeah, oh, that, that's that's pretty – that's pretty scary. That's pretty terrifying. And and ultimately, you know, my uh, my big issue with some of this stuff too is like once once they start, you know, to your point, Aaron. Once once they once they get a little courage behind them, once they start, where's it stop? Because as they've proven in a lot of other areas of our lives, like once they get going, like nobody's safe from any of this shit, right? And it's not going to stop anywhere. So, uh, you know, it's only a matter of time. And when you got those secret secret holes being drilled, that that's some scary shit. It's a good way to put it. Yeah, that's some scary yeah. shit. So what's next for Kafar? What do you got coming up? I know we're getting into the fall. We're getting ready to rock and roll, and you're going to be heading back out in the field, I'm sure. But, you know, from Kafaru's standpoint, you guys are just committed to continuing the innovation, continuing the real-world design experience, and making the highest quality shit you can make, I assume. That's what kind of everybody says. But for you, you know, what, what do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things is, like, right now, we've, we've almost doubled in size, but I've pissed away all our profit on growth, uh, <laughs> which is good. My, Been there. My – uh yeah, my, my business partner is super cool with that. So once, um, you know, we're looking to, we're moving to Wyoming to a building that's about three times or bigger the size that we're in now. So yep. I can't go into the, the depth or great detail of everything we're doing, but obviously expanding the line, um, you know, both in hunting and tactical. Um, we're also going to be offering training courses uh, for survival, um, high angle shooting, land navigation, archery, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. We're, we're, we're going to be having, a, more or less like a trading post, like, uh, like a back country or a, you know, in, an internet store of very high quality gear, not Kafaru gear, right. but things that we believe in, whether it be an outdoorsman or a really right stuff tripod or an MSR reactor, 
whatever footwear, you know, the things that we know to be good. Yep. So it's not going to just be a ton of crap. It's going to be the highest end stuff that we believe in. Um, and I'm excited about that. That's just another, you know, part, um, you know, as we're teaching people to survive, we're also offering the gear that they can use, whether it be Kafaru or other things. And, yeah. um, you know, we're working on expanding the, um, the, the shelter line, which has been an epic fucking pain in my ass. Sorry about the <laughs> F word, but, um, in the, uh, with COVID it's hard to find their state of the art materials we're trying to use. Yeah. And we just found out it's a 14 month lead time for the fabric. Oh Holy shit. What, why oh, did, did COVID wreck the world or yeah. something or <laughs> what's like, COVID? What, what happened? <laughs> oh, I know. Right. It's like whoever builds this, you know, must be, you know, made in some secret lab and, area 51 or something like 14 months i'm like good god almighty but you deal with what you i mean it's no different than where you know you get a black eye throw some ice on it and move forward i mean you got to figure it out and so you know some things are going smoother than others the shelter line and the stove lines we've got everything lined up to expand that we're just now waiting on parts and pieces um you know keeping everything made in the u.s is is becoming extremely uh, difficult for certain things like the fabric we wanted to use. They don't even make in the United States. Right. Like they don't, there is not, there is not an option in the U S so, um, but yeah, just that kind of thing, you're like just expanding in the right direction and, uh, you know, doing the best we can to inform and educate people while we're doing it. So when are you guys going to be, did you already break ground over there in Wyoming? Like you guys moving there right away we, then? We bought a building. So the tenant improvement will be going, we're waiting on the pricing for the, the tenant improvement now. And gotcha. then, uh, we should have that soon. So we're thinking, hoping July of next year, give yeah. or take, you know, is when the whole company would be moved up. Yeah. No, that's that's exciting, man. Well, it sounds like you got your plate full. Yeah. You got a yeah, lot, well, lot going on. I, I got a good crew. I mean, I mean a really good crew. Frank, who's the general manager, is a stud. Uh, Mackenzie just took over for marketing. She's like my little sister. Anders, who's in charge of, like, uh, shipping and QC, things like that. Yeah. I don't have to worry now when I'm gone. Like they're very, very, very good at decisions making. And, and I've made it a, I don't make decisions on my own. I make jokes about it all the time. I'm like, you know why I don't make bad decisions? Cause I don't make them. Yeah. I'm not the one making them. <laughs> yeah I said, we make yeah, them. That's yeah. why we don't make bad ones. Cause who am I to make a decision on a, you know, whatever somebody's, you know, you have department heads and managers. Why would I make a decision for their department without asking them? I mean, it's their department. So we, we all sit down and uh, it's, it's, I mean, certain things I have to make a decision, obviously, but I'm a very big proponent proponent of not micromanaging, yeah. hiring the people that don't need to be micromanaged. That's why they're there. And then when there's a big decision, you sit down at the round table, throw shit on the wall, everybody gets a decision and, and then move forward. Yep. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that one of the reasons why the company's going so well is everyone has skin in the game. Everybody has a dog in the fight. Like yep. they, they are all striving to, to be better. Yeah, that's, that's a lot how we try to operate over here. Everybody's, you know, one thing we talk about all the time is nobody's bigger than the project. So nobody's idea is going to supersede anybody else's, and, and there is no such thing as a bad idea. I mean, if you'd see the shit that we throw at the wall when it comes to concepting stuff, whether it's marketing and branding stuff we're working on for, for ourselves or for other companies or products or whatever it might be, it's like half the shit we look at and we're like, that was the dumbest thing ever. But, man, it's kind of funny that it's up there, you know. Yeah. And that's how you get the best out of everybody, I think, is, you know, you get that team atmosphere. Everybody's pulling their weight towards the same thing. So that's cool. Well, man. and I've said many times, you know, you you know, somebody may be the smartest in the room, but you're not as smart as everyone else in the room combined. Yeah. And so shut the fuck up, step back, become a team player. Yeah. I, I know you're intelligent but we're more intelligent together right. than we are separate. And so getting that mentality was fairly smooth, which was nice of, you know, cause you always get people that are, I mean, let's face it. Right? I'm a knuckle dragger. I barely graduated high school. So <laughs> I am not the smartest man in the room, but so we all get together in my insight, maybe from a field perspective or a leadership perspective, somebody else's maybe from the build perspective or the sewing perspective. And yeah. so all of that combined, you get a great uh, end result. Yeah. Well, you know, again, you got an admirer in the product and uh, and a personal fan in me. I love everything that you guys have done over the years. Uh, I'm excited to see what comes next out of Kafaru. I'll keep keep rocking the shit and representing it in the backcountry on all my adventures for sure. 
Uh, you know, I think we're pretty well. We getting down to down to the wire here, AB. Yeah, we're getting we're getting close on time yeah, here. Look, looks like we're getting it down. And you know, I just more or less, Aaron. You know, appreciate your willingness to jump on with us and, and shoot the shit. You know, like I said when we started, you and I have never actually sat down and chatted before. You know, I appreciate the opportunity. It's an honor to sit here and talk with you because you know I admire everything you do, both out in the field and from a company perspective. I, I appreciate you guys having me on. I um, actually, when you'd gotten a hold of me, I was like, "Oh shit, I've seen these guys. This is awesome!" So I, I was excited when you when you asked me to hop on. So I appreciate it. Good yeah, deal, no man. problem, man. Anytime. Good deal. Well, listen, you stay safe in everything you're doing out there. Keep doing what you're doing, and uh, best of luck through the fall. And who knows? You know, we're really just trying to you know kick this podcast off on our end. I'm not really good at any of this shit that we do over here. AB kind of runs some of this stuff, but if we get the opportunity to hop on later in the fall or later in the year and follow up and shoot the shit some more, I would lo- I would welcome the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Or you guys can hop on. Hop on ours or a little bit of both. And yeah, um, yeah I'd be, would be more than happy to get you guys on ours for sure. Cool. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it, man. Yep. You guys take it easy. I appreciate it. All right. You too, man. Talk to you soon. Red song is on my. Mama say it's a new day song.